Michael Bedard. Yousefi is the founder and CEO of Ariana AI. And he will talk about ultra low power and scalable computing memory AI accelerator for next generation edge inference. You have the stage, Bedard. Um, thanks, Boris. Uh, yeah, my name is Bedard Yousefi. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Ariana AI. And it's an honor for us to have our first um, public disclosure of AI acceleration technology at uh, Tiny Level Summit. So when I was researching for this presentation, I came across a lot of parallels between the struggles that the industry faced back in the 1930s and 40s in order to come up with some sort of general purpose uh, and universal computing machine and the struggle we're facing today in the industry in our search for a general purpose uh, AI processor. So I think it might be helpful to kind of like, you know, go back and review the history. So hopefully um, we can learn from it. Uh, so. Computers back in the day were designed to run uh, just one program. So this was called fixed program computing. And if you wanted to change that program, you had to go back to a drawing board and uh, spend several weeks rewiring the computer in order for it to run a different program. Now, this sounds kind of familiar today as we've seen this push in the industry to have uh, completely different hardware architectures um, handling different AI workloads. So uh, the strategy of having different AI solutions for different applications obviously didn't work out back in the day. And in my humble opinion, I don't think it's going to be successful this time around either. So the solution to this problem back in the day was that instead of the uh, wiring or the, the hardware architecture of a computer basically uh, dictating its intended use, uh, there were like a set of instructions that were stored in memory that uh, dynamically instructed the computer what to do. So this was called von Neumann architecture, and um, so the idea was proposed by Alan Turing in the 1930s, and then it was later developed by John Presper Eckert and John Mouchley in the 1940s, and basically became so, became so successful over the next uh, seven or eight decades that uh, basically turned into the blueprint of all uh, modern computing platforms. So today everybody's talking about all the reasons we should move away from uh, von Neumann architecture, but I think it might be uh, helpful to kind of understand why it was so successful for such a long time. Um, so this architecture was successful mainly for two reasons. Uh, one was that it was very flexible, uh, meaning that if you give it enough time and memory, it could accomplish any kind of uh, mathematical task. The second reason for its success was that uh, it was very scalable. So if you wanted to have higher compute power, all you needed to do was to um, uh, speed up the computation or maybe increase the size of the memory or width of data, and that's it. Uh, we didn't really need to go back and change the, uh, the software side of things. Uh, it was obviously uh, greatly helped by Moore's Law too, as it generated faster and cheaper CPUs um, year over year. So I call these two rules like flexibility and scalability, the two golden rules of von Neumann architecture, and I think they're critical for commercial success of any computing platform. So when we start moving away from um, um, compute centric towards data centric processing, uh, priorities start shifting and von Neumann architecture uh, started falling out of favor. So what used to be the compute bottleneck, which could improve by having faster processors, turn into the memory bottleneck where having faster processors didn't necessarily help. So uh, uh, it turns out that the flexibility that was the hallmark of uh, von Neumann architecture now came at a cost of uh, power and performance penalties. So this slide illustrates the significance of the memory bottleneck. Uh, so assume that you want to do um, an 8 bits multiplying accumulate operation uh, with a um, small size of 32 kilobytes of on-chip SRAM and a 32-bit wide accumulator. When you measure the energy consumed to carry out this uh, operation, you realize that 95% uh, of it is wasted in data movement and only 5% goes towards the actual computation. So this kind of shows that uh, like the biggest bang for the buck in terms of improving the overall system efficiency is uh, addressing this memory bottleneck. So the best way to tackle the memory bottleneck is to embed the computation within the memory so that like, you know, we can minimize the data movement. Um, so this has been explored and compute and memory architecture, um, SIM for short, uh, where the computation is performed in analog domain. And uh, so this requires these um, analog to digital and digital to analog converters, uh, which are um, placed outside of the memory array. 
So the weight parameters are uh, programmed into some sort of non-volatile memory cells um, whose conductance is multiplied by the analog outputs of the DAX um, to kind of generate these residual currents, which are then accumulated and uh, sampled by the ADCs to be converted back to digital. So this way we got rid of the, uh, or greatly reduced the memory bottleneck, but we're introducing another overhead, which is the data conversion, uh, which needs to be looked into in order to understand its impact on the overall system efficiency and performance. Um, so it turns out that the data conversion overhead is quite significant. Uh, so it's been shown that data converters take up to 85% of the world power and 98% of the world area. So in a way we solved the memory bottleneck, but we're introducing another one, uh, which seems to be even worse. So it seems like we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. Also this architecture um, severely lacks scalability. So if you look into like how it's uh, fabricated, there's this logic technology, which is optimized for power and performance. And it's used to kind of construct these data converters. And uh, there's a memory technology, which is optimized for density and is used to fabricate the memory array. And when you put these two technologies together on the same die, you end up with the worst of the both worlds, which severely limits the scalability of this architecture. Also, uh, because of the uh, power-hungry write operation uh, for uh, non-volatile memories, uh, the user um, uh, has to have like all the, uh, all the weight coefficients stored on chip before they can actually start the operation. Um, so this is not great because now you have to size up your chip according to the largest network you want to run on it, and uh, this uh, leads to a pretty expensive and over-designed solution. And uh, also for the same reason, um, the user is stuck with the weight stationary data flow, and as we know, this is not always the most optimal data flow for different neural networks or uh, within the same neural network have different layers. So um, it turns out like when we embed the computation and the data conversion within the memory, uh, we can address all the problems I mentioned earlier. So we call this architecture compute and quantize in memory, uh, CQIM for short, where the, uh, the A to D and D to A conversion is carried out by the same circuit structures. Um, so, so this is great because now we can have a very great uh, power and area saving. So the entire memory is uh, self-contained and uh, no signal travels outside of a memory for computation or data conversion. Uh, the memory is built on these unit cells called multiplying bit cells, which in aggregation, they, uh, they operate as DACs and ADCs um, in order to kind of uh, generate the MAC results and accumulate it and then uh, convert it back into digital. The computation is carried out by um, like reading the weight parameters, which are stored in typical SRAM bit cells, and then multiplied by the input activations and converted to charge uh, through some unit capacitors, then accumulated on these uh, vertical accumulation lines, um, and then converted back to digital uh, through the operations of these uh, multiplying bit cells. Uh, there are two more subtle but very important features of this architecture. Um, one is that uh, this architecture only requires one quantization per dot product. Um, and that is regardless uh, of the uh, resolution of the computation. So this is great because we can reduce the overall data conversion energy by 8x uh, compared to SIM-based architectures where higher resolution computations are broken down into several lower resolution ones. And the quantized results is like, um, it's scaled and solved in digital. Also this uh, architecture comes with a fully programmable resolution um, and without compromising the hardware utilization rate. So this is very significant because uh, uh, it kind of shows that it can handle um, a, a wide variety of uh, AI workloads while maintaining a pretty high efficiency and uh, performance. So with the CQIM, we're breaking a lot of records. Uh, so we're achieving the uh, very high efficiency of 40 tops per watt uh, for an 8-bit compute. Um, and our um, computational density is also highest reported at uh, two tops per millimeter squared, again, for an 8-bit compute, um, even though our prototype is fabricated in a decade-old technology node. And because of the true parallelism inside this architecture, we can, uh, we can enjoy a very high memory bandwidth of uh, two terabytes per second per core. And um, uh, we can achieve a very high um, computational 
uh, dynamic range uh, among um, other analog based solutions. So uh, for successful commercialization, um, perhaps more important than specification is the compatibility with the von Neumann golden rules, as I mentioned in the first few slides. Um, so CQIM is fully compatible with them. Uh, it can maintain a very high efficiency across a um, wide range of DNN workloads. And uh, so this is uh, significant as we've seen this uh, can be an explosion of different AI models uh, developed in the industry in the last few years. And um, so it's just no longer uh, commercially viable to just pick one of these models and optimize the solution, the hardware solution just for that. Um, and also because uh, it has a pretty uh, typical SRAM write operation, it can implement all different data flow optimizations, uh, not just weight stationary. And uh, because of the true parallelism inside this architecture, uh, it can make two different data types stationary at once. So we call this double stationary data flow, which uh, reuses data more efficiently. Um, and as mentioned, the user can um, program the resolution of, uh, of the computation um, across different layers and data types without compromising the hardware utilization rates. Uh, so that is very significant in, in terms of like, you know, improving the flexibility of this architecture. Um, it is also very scalable. So it's fabricated in standard CMOS process and tracks uh, very well with the Moore's law and can be ported or even compiled in the latest um, technology node with no problem. And it's uh, almost it's built almost entirely on digital blocks, uh, which scale much better than analog blocks, as uh, they rely on the switching characteristics of uh, transistors as opposed to IV characteristics of transistors. So this is great because now we don't really need to like we don't have any kind of uh, calibration or post training to kind of um, uh, get rid of the un analog non idealities, uh, which seems to be the case for other analog based solutions. And um, so this whole thing is uh, fabricated on pretty small size tiles, um, which um, give this architecture enough granularity to kind of in improve the and increase the performance by uh, increasing the number of tiles. So this is our status. Uh, we're backed by a National Science Foundation. Uh, we started in late 2019. We uh, successfully taped out our first test chip in uh, 2020 and uh, we've been issued two patents so far. Uh, we're very small, but we're rapidly growing. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Bedard, for this very nice talk. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the platform, but let me ask you one. Um, can you sure. give us a feel for the for the problem size that your initial prototype is looking to handle uh, in terms of what kinds of networks or or ML problems that you're addressing. So, so this one with this last tape out, we kind of prove one tile, the functionality of one tile, and going forward, we want to put more of them together and like have a pretty nice, um, efficient way of like communicating between the tiles. So right now, we're just like to, um, focusing on the actual operation of the uh, the, the tile, and then going forward, uh, yeah, we want to like you know uh, couple this with a very nice compiler that can efficiently distribute the the workloads. Um, among the tiles, and so we can actually carry out um, more significant uh, AI inferences. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, in the interest of time, we'll move on. Um, uh, thanks again, Bedat. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors first. It's ARM uh, that develops software and hardware for TinyML. Welcome. Samsung, these three are the executive, spon executive sponsors. And, and then followed by Platinum sponsors, PTA Compute, Lattice Semiconductors, and the gold sponsors are Brain Chip Corporation, Cisco, DSP Group, H Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, 
general matter labs uh, green waves technologies Hymex. Imagine Mob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, Pixel, Reality AI. SensML, Silicon Labs, Sintiant, and Google TensorFlow, Exmos. And the civil sponsors are H Cortex, Hoyts, and uh, Sinsense. Again, we are very grateful for their continued support. And this is a great testimony that uh, the foundation and this community is, re is really of, of huge interest for, for the companies and, and, and for the whole uh, for the whole world.